uh, for teacher coaching. You see, and as long as we have a school year that's actually getting shorter by the day and getting shorter by the hour, as schools struggle uh, to, in effect, raise class sizes. And uh, what did Hawaii reduce their class school year to 156 days or 157 days or something like that? I mean, the bottom line is until we recognize that, that a big part of the deficiency in public education in this country, particularly the K-8 K-12 system, is the fact that our school day and school year is about a third longer than it is in, in the developed and industrial and many of the developed countries, we're going to continue to be disappointed with the results no matter how successful our efforts to do these other reforms are. Ms. Ward, would you close out our time with our witnesses? I'll be brief. <laughs> I know we're a bit over, but I just wanted to start by um, sharing <coughs> one of my favorite Drucker quotes, which is, you can't manage what you can't measure. If you're not getting results, there should be consequences. And I think we've been talking quite a lot about consequences and to some extent about flexibility, but I'd love to hear from many of our panelists about where the next ESCA should be more, not only more flexible, but where it should be more prescriptive. Where is there that healthy tension between flexibility and, and more mandates, quite frankly, that allow us to have continuity across the states? No, no, no. Uh, so where should, uh, where, should, where should ESCA be more prescriptive, more flexible? Um, so the, the president's <coughs> talked a lot about tight on ends, loose on means as a basic kind of frame, and uh, Colorado likes that approach. We, I think it's important that accountability be earned. And I know it, some of what we've proposed uh, with respect to getting rid of a date certain so that we actually focus on every kid's date certain, their graduation date, is somewhat controversial to some because not every state's ready. So, and we've just talked about choice. And, uh, and, and, and Paul, you just talked about the, uh, the need to get the policy environment right. They, you know, that, that's, that's critical. So we think that as ESEA is reauthorized, um, there's a, a number of things um, that are going to reinforce, reinforce. The differentiated approach to accountability is right. States need to have ownership. We have to be on the hook to take action with schools and districts. And to do that, there's going to be a little different, you know, approach in each state but that, that, that we can tolerate. Um, but the end game's got to be the same. So where we can get more prescriptive is get rid of the other category, right? There's got to be a point when you lose your authorization to operate as a school or district if your results are persistently poor. And so we can tighten a little bit there and then give more flexibility. Choice, supplemental services, issues like that. For Colorado, we're a statewide open enrollment state. We'd like to see other states go in that direction where every parent has a right to choose their school with a robust charter school sector. If you don't have that, then perhaps the federal government can be more prescriptive about offering choice for certain students. We think all students should have that choice. So getting, providing incentives, and, and, and this issue about rewards versus consequences, right? They're all incentives, and we talk about them in different terms. We've got to make sure that we reward states, we reward schools, we reward districts for their performance, we reward states for the policies they put in place by providing greater latitude. Where, greater, where that's not happening, the federal government become more prescriptive. Uh, but the idea that we reward, that we provide greater autonomy first and, and, and make sure that states get policies in place. Again, Race to the Top helped us do this across the country. We've seen more change in the policy environment than we've seen in a very long time. And that's got to keep up. But the absolutes need to stay there. What the destination is needs to be common. How we measure against that destination should be common. We should be able to have a much more common across state conversation about, a conversation about return on investment. Those are federal interests that need to be established. States need to be rewarded and sanctioned for not delivering on a policy environment or on the results that they need to achieve. But they've got those results have to be against this internationally benchmarked destination we, we say is good enough. And then we've got to get that policy environment in shape with some clear absolutes, but staying true to this basic framing idea of tight on ends, that destination, those absolutes, loose on the means so that states can begin owning their own performance and not having the federal government reach into individual schools and actually having the conversation from Washington rather than us having the conversation with our own districts and schools. Uh, I don't think there's much, given our constitutional system and the way education is financed in this country, that the federal government can mandate. Uh, and I, I think it, 
It's not going to happen. It didn't happen in No Child Left Behind. It's not going to happen now. Uh, I don't see it happening out into the future. The question really is, in the delicate balance of federalism, what can the federal government do as an investor, as a representative of the people as a whole, uh, with an understanding that the whole nation needs to move forward, uh, you know, particularly its disadvantaged students, to more effective education? What can it do to, to cajole, to pressure, to create incentives, to help, uh, to prod, uh, what can it do to as it, it, to move us forward in in that kind, in those kinds of directions? I think those are really the issues that are at hand, and I think we're all trying to figure out. Uh, you know, President, uh, the first President Bush thought about it in terms of goals. Uh, President Clinton thought about it with the IASA. President Bush thought about it with No Child Left Behind. I think President uh, Obama. Is, very, is being very creative with his secretary in looking at ways and race to the top and other kinds of incentives. The use of Title II, we haven't talked about that. Uh, to, and I think Roberto Rodriguez deserves a lot of credit and the administration and others do for thinking about how we can create, uh, you know, effective, uh, constructive pressure to change the way things are done differently. And I think really it's more that than it is mandates. I think it gets a little closer to, man, to, to eligible for mandate, if you will, or susceptible of something like a mandate, as I mentioned all morning, all afternoon, about, about disadvantaged students. I think we're, we, we, the federal government has a stake in the success of disadvantaged students. So it seems to me if we're failing, if they're in schools that never get better, uh, that's why I suggested there be something like mandatory choice. Uh, that's why I like the administration's plan that the district and the state's options become fewer if these states stay on that list year after year after year, dropout factories that they are and so forth and so on. Um, but I think there are things, again, that this, the federal government can create incentives for. Uh, better teacher preparation, uh, better options, better and more effective teaching, uh, better research. Uh, we've seen, I think, a, an explosion of, of really good research in the last decade, better than anything we've seen, that really will help our students learn more effectively. So I really think it's more what can be done that's helpful. I think we're entering an era where we're going to be more interested in the carrot than the stick. I'm not sure we ever really had a stick. Everybody talks about No Child Left Behind being a stick. I don't think No Child Left Behind really mandated much of anything. It's blamed for most, most everything. But most of the decisions in 1116 that are made by states and districts are made by states and districts. Uh, and it's not like someone said you had to do this as opposed to that. But, and I don't think it'll ever be, is, that real, is my real answer to your question. The question is how can the federal government be smart about creating pressure that brings about change and improvement principally for disadvantaged students around the things that are the levers that can cause that change? Ms. Moaning, I think you have the last comment from the commission. I do, and I want to answer your question, Ms. Ward, exactly as you asked it. I believe the piece of No Child Left Behind that they got completely right was being prescriptive about the requirement to disaggregate student scores by specific student population. Uh, that which gets measured is what we learn to treasure. And speaking from the, from the field, from someone who has worked with campuses throughout this entire eight years, I can tell you, I have seen teachers, <coughs> campus leaders, principals, central office staff view the performance of individual groups of students in a totally different way than we did before. We, we know who is learning. We know who is not learning. And we have made it our business to find out what needs to happen to ensure that every student group continues to learn. I really urge you to uh, focus on maintaining that piece of ESEA because it has been a tremendous benefit uh, to students with disabilities, to students of color, to English language learners, to students from economically disadvantaged homes. It has made a difference. If the two witnesses want to say something, could limit it to 30 seconds, please. Uh, yeah, just very quickly. The, um, I think um, 
the administration is talking about making the title funds competitive. I, I, I think they should be tied to the length of the day and length of the year. You don't have enough time, you can't accomplish much. I also think on the flexibility side, flexibility, for example, we're looking to use our SES funds, our TANF funds, our 21st century funds, all to fuel our extended school day and our extended school year. So I think, obviously, that if the administration is going to move in that direction, more flexibility, use those funds, and obviously making those other funds, tying those other funds to the length of the day and length of the school year, I think that will be a positive addition, and I think that should be mandated. Thank you. I would just say real quickly, I think one of the fundamental roles of the federal government in education is to provide good information. And if they do nothing else than require through reauthorization that states have to publish publicly and report publicly, um, more robust measures, which they now are capable of doing, it is a game changer. It changes everything. And that means putting it into context, putting it into actionable form, and putting it in a way that stakeholders understand what that information means. It changes everything. And having that ability to look at it across states especially changes it. Do you think Thank they're positioned? Do you, Very think, they're, much. Do you so think they're positioned to do so? Are, I'm sorry? Do, are they positioned to do it? States? Yeah. No, Absolutely. Federal, federal government. Federal uh, in terms of mandating that states report this? So or to take it and make it information for action that can be simply, simply digested. States should be able to do that. And states are in a position to do that right now. And that's my whole message is that states now have the capacity and should be asked to report on this information. Rather than doing fancy federal audits about are you using this money, it's like if people can produce the outcomes and the statistics to show things, it shows that they're doing things well. So. Thank you, both commissioners and witnesses. We really appreciate the dialogue that we, I think, started today. We're going to move on to yeah. our, to our uh, audience for questions. And actually, they're not questions. I, I should correct myself. There will be no questions. You all can stay here, or you can move down, either one. Uh, there will be no questions for either the commissioners or the witnesses. These are statements. We're gathering information, so we want to hear from you. I'm, I would ask you, and I'm very sorry about this, to keep your comments to under a minute. And then also we have a really mean timekeeper, <laughs> Kelly from the commission will be making sure you keep it under uh, a minute for brevity's sake. And we're going to try and get as many folks as we can in, but we have about 10 minutes to do it in. Thank you. First one. Um, and would you state your name and where you're from? My name is Robbie McCarty. I'm on the faculty at LSU in Baton Rouge and I recently moved to New Orleans. Um, uh, I learned quite a bit from the things that the witnesses provided. Um, I have one area that I'm confused about. Um, the Colorado growth model, I think, is an excellent um, way to begin to look at individual children. People had lots of things to say about uh, focusing on inclusion of all students. Well, in, that, uh, in the case of Dr. Mooning, it was look at all special education students um, and including them. Um, and um, Mr. Kress quoted a lot of gains in the NAEP da data. Um, I'm concerned with how we reconcile all of these positives with the negative effect that um, No Child Left Behind has had on gifted students. The data on gifted students is that their performance has flatlined since 2004. They continue to progress two years after NCLLB went into effect, but I think that was their own efforts to keep pushing themselves, and then they just completely flatlined. Um, I don't think that a common curriculum at the state or the national level um, will serve to, I, I think it will box in gifted children. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I wonder if the Saints would have won the Super Bowl if all of them had been administered the same size shoe to wear in Miami. If you look at, the, the effort to look at kids as individuals is great, but then we have to differentiate the program that we give to them. Um, we did end social promotion, but I'm afraid that NCLB has installed in its place intellectual retention. These kids are left behind. The federal, uh, the federal government has a tremendous stake in the progress of gifted kids. Uh, if we feel that the government can't mandate attention and understanding to this group, then they could at least reward those who are doing it well. Louisiana in particular is considered one of the top five states in gifted education, but even in Louisiana, superintendents are unaware of this or maybe uninterested. Thank uh, you. I'm going to ask you to wind okay. up your comments, please. Uh, Thanks. Well, me, uh, I'll close with no. just this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I really meant thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, my name is Dr. Barbara Ferguson. I'm a longtime educator from New Orleans and also an attorney. 
All right, under Title V of No Child Left Behind on Innovative Strategies and Schools of Choice, they list charter schools as a school of choice, saying that children are to have an equal opportunity to attend, and if more children elect to attend and can be accommodated, that a lottery, lottery will be used. All right, what we request is that you clarify that. In New Orleans and Louisiana, um, charter schools are not schools of choice. Ma they are magnet schools, many of them converted into charter schools, and they provide a conditioned opportunity. I was principal of a magnet school, Warren Easton High School, one of the best performing magnet schools. After Hurricane Katrina, this school became a charter school. It's still one of the best performing. If charter school money is it tied to charter school, um, is tied to open admissions to equal opportunity as deemed under the Civil Rights Act, then no state should be allowed to use its charter school funds, according to what No Child Left Behind says, I believe, for schools that have a conditioned opportunity. And by that, I mean admission requirements or continued admission requirements. Also, under schools of choice, we request that you take under Title I, following targeted assistance, where it says school-wide programs with schools with over 40 percent of low-income children, that those schools can be given an opportunity to develop a school-wide council and use all those funds. Um, can I wait until the gentleman stops talking? Thank you. Well, and and they could use all of those funds to implement, um, they can use all of those funds at the school site level and the state's boards of education needs to ensure to give them that opportunity and would re request that you take part of this or reference this from Title V back into Title I. And under the third, my third comment is regarding the recovery school district. Our research shows that the recovery school district has not improved, that over 1,500 failing students are still out there, high school students. And we uh, would like you to put some accountability at the state level. As you know, there are three options that the state can either take over the school Thank district, you. but we would, we would request accountability at the state level. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Karen Harper Royal. I'm a parent of a current school, uh, school age child in New Orleans. And the comments I have are that I would like you to be sure that the reauthorization of EA, EASA um, includes an enhancement to parent education so that they can make informed choices. There's lots of information coming at parents and oftentimes they're not able to uh, filter through that information to make informed choices and to go along with that states and districts need to do more to report that data in ways that parents can understand it so that they can utilize it to make choices and if charter schools are going to be a part of this reform we need to make sure that charter schools and their boards are uh, accessible to parents and, and include parents. The next thing is to ensure that there are ways that schools um, do not use special education students' test results as a disincentive to enroll those students as parents do exercise choice in um, going to various schools. That's one of the things that we're finding here is that it's a disincentive to have certain types of disabilities, not all, but certain types of disabilities at school and because there's competition for students. And my last thing is to support OCR in investigating some of the civil rights violations OCR in the past several years has not been as stringent in investigating the civil rights violations. Thank you very Thank much. You. And I would ask the last two uh, commenters to really keep it under a minute because we want to make sure both of you get in. So, sir, under a minute. Okay, uh, theory, action, fo focus, music to the ears, the pictures from fourth to eighth grade. What I'm trying to say is uh, no seed left behind. I came here to speak to uh, the governor, uh, Bobby Jindal, to ask him permission to take the seeds. Aaron Broussard gave me the seeds of Jefferson Parish and I watched them all rot. Every seed in Louisiana is rotting that belongs to the governor. I wanted to ask him to plant the Garden of God. That well, means The governor, you, sir, isn't here today, so yes. do you have comments for the if commission? You, no, I'm speaking to you. I want to put a picture of the Garden of God. If you see the garden, you're going to know you're living in it. And this is how you give the children an education. You let them see the gardens. If you see it, you're going to believe it. That means a picture. And to teach children fourth or eighth, you teach them how to sing, to words, to whether it's science, math, or whatever, to increase their education. Thank you very I've much. I've studied No Child Behind for eight years. Thank you very much, sir. And our final comment. Good afternoon. Boom! You did it. We're born in the name of the Messiah. Oh, 
Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Massey, Executive Director of Communities and Schools of Greater New Orleans. We are one of the 200 affiliates of the Communities and Schools Network across the country focused on dropout prevention by integrating... Could you just get to your comment? <clears throat> yes. My point is, is that we were um, assisting the late Senator Kennedy in dropping the uh, legislation related to keeping pace, which um, calls for, as part of the reauthorization, um, intentional financial supports for those of us who are able to take the community resources that are out there and get them more effectively and efficiently connected to teachers and children um, to help them with their academics. So I just ask you to, um, to pay attention to that legislation um, as part of your considerations. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. I apologize to those of you that didn't get a chance to speak and to those of you that unfortunately we had to cut off. I will remind you that there is a website where you can uh, read more um, of the testimony, nclbcommission.org. And also I would ask you to keep in mind that there will be other hearings across the country. And if you can get there, we certainly invite you there. Thank you so much. And also, uh, the other thing, more important thing, is you can post your comments on the website. So if you didn't get to make your full comments or if you didn't get to make your comments, go to nclbcommission.org and you can make your comments there. Thank you very much.